All right. Welcome back to ABA exam review and our continuation of our latest RBT practice exam, where we're going to do the next set of questions together and breaking them down. If you're new to the channel, welcome. If you're returning, welcome back. Please like and subscribe. Be sure to check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials, including our famous combo pack. As always, when you pass, let us know so we can include you in the Sunday. Shout out, work hard, study hard. Let's get going. Number nine. Cynthia asks to hold on to her cup so she can drink her milk. The cup has a lid on it, but it will leak milk when tipped upside down. Cynthia tips the cup over and laughs as the milk falls on the floor. Her mom takes the cup, causing Cynthia to cry, but Cynthia no longer tips her milk cup. What changed the behavior? So what we're looking at is Cynthia's behavior. And with every behavior question, you always have to identify whose behavior are you looking at, whose behavior changed. And it helps to identify antecedents and consequences. Getting really good at identifying antecedents and consequences are going to make so many of these questions much, much easier. So what is Cynthia doing? Well, we know she has her cup, and then when it tips over, it will leak milk. So what does Cynthia do? She tips the cup over and laughs as milk falls on the floor. As a result, the consequence is the mom takes the cup, right? So Cynthia's holding the cup. She tips it over, milk falls on the floor. Mom takes the cup, and that causes Cynthia to cry. But what happens to Cynthia's behavior? Well, she no longer tips her milk cup. Her behavior has decreased. So when behavior decreases, the consequence is punishment. And now we have to ask ourselves, well, did mom add the punishment, or did she remove the punishment? In other words, was something added to the scenario or something taken away? Well, in this case, it's clear her mom took the cup. She removed the cup causing Cynthia to cry, but also reducing the behavior. So since something was removed, we have negative. So what's removed, negative, behavior decreased, we're looking at punishment. So what changed the behavior? A, negative reinforcement. What well, can't be reinforcement because the behavior decreased. Reinforcement only increases behavior. B, positive punishment. Well, it's not positive because what was taken away was the cup. As a consequence, the mom removed the cup. So it has to be C, negative punishment. Cup was removed, making it negative. Behavior decreased, making it punishment. What changed the behavior? C, negative punishment. 10, if you were to choose a measurement procedure that would allow you to observe your client as little as possible while collecting data, which of the following answer choices would be the worst choice? Okay, be very careful here, right? What is the question specifying? Specifying the worst choice. So you've got to really take your time, right? Because you don't want to read too quickly jump to the answer choices and miss that part. It's a very important piece. And what kind of choice are we making? Well, we want a measurement procedure that's going to allow us to observe your client as little as possible. Meaning three of these are probably going to do that. They're going to allow us to observe the client as little as possible, while the worst choice isn't. So A, partial interval recording. With partial interval recording, how often do you need to observe the client? Well, the entire time you're measuring, right? Even if you're only measuring for 20 minutes, you still have to observe the client the whole 20 minutes because with partial interval, you've got to observe every single behavior that occurs during those 20 minutes, right? Because if your intervals are 15 seconds long and the behavior is only occurring at the end of each interval, you've got to stick around for every single interval and observe. So partial interval is not really going to allow us to observe the client as little as possible. What about B, momentary time sampling? Well, this is much better, right? Because if my intervals are 15 seconds, I only need to observe the client at the end of each interval because with momentary time sampling, we're only recording data once an interval ends. At the very end of each interval, we're looking up and seeing, is the behavior occurring? Is it not? See, permanent product would probably be the best for this, right? Because with permanent product, in theory, you don't even have to observe the behavior because all you're measuring is the product of the behavior, which is one of the advantages of permanent product. And then D, play check, planned activity check, is just momentary time sampling for a group scenario. It's the same idea as momentary time sampling. So B, C, and D are all going to allow us to do other things other than observing the client continuously. Partial interval recording, even though we might only be recording a sample of the behavior, we still need to observe the client the entire time. So the worst choice for observing the client as little as possible is going to be A, partial interval recording. 
11. Which of the following interventions are key components of differential reinforcement? Now, differential reinforcement is an incredibly important piece of what you do as a behavior technician. You use differential reinforcement all the time, and you've got to understand what are the components of differential reinforcement? What are we trying to achieve? Well, differential reinforcement teaches all kinds of things, right? It teaches discrimination. It teaches differentiation. Depending on what you're using, it can teach replacement behaviors. So what interventions are key components of differential reinforcement? A, punishment and reinforcement. Is punishment part of differential reinforcement? No, it is not. Differential reinforcement is its own intervention. Now, you can write treatment plans, or your supervisors can write treatment plans that include both, but punishment is not part of a differential reinforcement intervention. Differential reinforcement is its own intervention. So B, extinction and reinforcement. Yes, with differential reinforcement, you're putting something on extinction and you're reinforcing something else. That is the key idea behind differential reinforcement. C, extinction and punishment. Well, we know extinction is, but we've already talked about why punishment is not a key component of differential reinforcement. And then D, all three are key components. That is not true. The two key components of differential reinforcement are extinction and reinforcement. We're putting a target behavior on extinction, or we're putting something on extinction, and then we're reinforcing otherwise. So extinction and reinforcement are our key components of differential reinforcement. 12, a physical therapist is teaching a toddler to walk. The physical therapist holds onto both of the toddler's hands and walks with them. Then the therapist holds onto only one of the toddler's hands. Then the therapist lightly touches the client's back. What is the therapist doing? So we're looking at that therapist, right? Always understand what the question is asking, and it's asking about the therapist's behavior. We know the therapist is teaching the toddler to walk. So first, they hold onto both of the hands, walk with them. So almost a full physical prompt, right? Then the therapist holds onto only one of the toddler's hands. So we're moving a little bit less than full physical. Then the therapist lightly touches the client's back. So now it's really just a partial physical. So what is this therapist doing here? A, prompt fading. Well, sure, right? We're slowly fading out the prompts. First, I've got both hands and I'm walking fully with them. And then I only hold one hand. And then I lightly touch the client back. And then ideally next is no physical prompts at all. So we're fading throughout the physical prompts. What about B, schedule thinning? Well, schedule thinning and schedule thickening, we're talking about reinforcement schedules. And we're not really necessarily referring to reinforcement in this question. We're not sure what they're using as reinforcement. It's all about the prompts here, right? The physical prompts. What about C, least to most prompting? Well, they're not least to most prompting. They're, they're if anything, they're most to least, right? Because they're going from more intrusive to less intrusive. The most intrusive prompt is a full physical prompt, which is where we started. The least intrusive prompt is just letting the client try without any prompts at all, which is not where we're at. And then D, graduated guidance. So be careful. Graduated guidance, right, is a form of physical prompting. But with graduated guidance, you're only providing physical assistance as needed, and then you're immediately withdrawing it. It's not what the physical therapist is doing here. It's very systematic, right? They're starting off with the prompt. With graduated guidance, you would only physically prompt if necessary, and then you would remove it immediately, which isn't happening here, right? It's very a very systematic fading of the physical prompts from essentially a full physical prompt to a very, very limited partial physical prompt. So what is the therapist doing? A, prompt fading. 13, a behavior technician is asked to assist their supervisor in identifying the function of a behavior. They work together to manipulate antecedents and consequences until they decide the most likely function is attention. What is the best answer describing this scenario? Okay, so when you're thinking about this scenario, what they're trying to do is identify the function of a behavior. And we have three main assessments. We have an indirect assessment, a direct assessment, and a functional analysis. Now, it gets a little tricky because a functional analysis is technically a direct assessment, but all direct assessments are functional analyses, right? So an indirect assessment is just an interview, a survey. We're not actually observing the client do anything, right? It's the worst way to identify a function. A direct assessment is typically our ABC recordings or event recordings where we're observing the client 
things, but we're not manipulating anything yet. In a functional analysis, we're actually going in there and manipulating antecedents and consequences to determine the function. The best way to do to determine the function is through a functional analysis. And the way you're going to identify a functional analysis is when you hear about manipulation. So if we're actually manipulating antecedents and consequences, we're adding things, we're taking things away, that is going to be a functional analysis. And yes, a functional analysis is a direct assessment, but the best answer, right? The best answer is a functional analysis because it most describes what's occurring here. So again, an indirect assessment is the worst at identifying functions because you're not actually observing the, the learner. You're just talking with people who know the learner and you're doing surveys and you're doing interviews and you're doing checklists. A direct assessment is better. Or we're still not manipulating anything. We're just recording or event recording or ABC recording. We're not actually manipulating anything. In a functional analysis, that's going to be the best because we're actually manipulating antecedents and the consequences, changing things in the environment, looking at the effect on the behavior, and from there, making the hypothesis of what the possible function might be. So the best answer for what these what this behavior technician and supervisor did was a functional analysis because they're actually manipulating antecedents and consequences to identify the function of a behavior. Rachel is allergic to artificial sweeteners. She must read the labels of all the food she buys at the store. Rachel is able to determine what items she can and cannot eat and only buys what she can eat. What skill is Rachel demonstrating? So what is Rachel doing here? We know she is allergic to sweeteners, and so she's reading labels of all the food she buys. What's the behavior here? Well, it's reading or it's buying, okay? And what Rachel is doing is only buying what she can eat. So we're really looking at Rachel's ability to only buy what she needs. And in order to do that, she has to be able to look at these different foods and determine do they have these sweeteners or not? And how can she possibly do that? What skill is involved here? A, differentiation. Well, differentiation, response differentiation, is when the subject or the learner engages in different responses. The same response is occurring. Rachel is buying things, right? The response isn't changing. Rachel is buying food. What's changing is what food she's buying. And so what she's doing is discrimination, stimulus discrimination. She's able to discriminate between food that has the allergic sweeteners and food that doesn't. She's still buying. The, the, the response isn't changing. She's just discriminating between what stimuli she can and can't purchase. That is discrimination. She reads one box. It has the sweeteners. She reads another. It doesn't. What does she do? Well, she picks the one that doesn't. She's discriminating between what she can and can't buy, the good stimuli versus the bad. Response generalization. She's not generalizing responses because there's no new novel responses occurring. She's just buying what she can eat. And then shaping. She's not shaping her own behavior. There's no approximations. So shaping just doesn't fit. What Rachel is doing is discriminating between the good stimuli, the non-allergic stimuli, and the bad stimuli, the allergic stimuli. Rachel is demonstrating discrimination or stimulus discrimination. 15, a new Asian Italian fusion restaurant just opened up in your city. The manager of the restaurant wants to get an idea of how many customers are coming into the restaurant each night during the first month of business. What measurement will be best for the manager to use? All right, a pretty straightforward measurement question. And with measurement questions, ask yourself, what are we measuring? Well, the manager of this restaurant wants an idea of how many. So immediately, that should be setting off alarm bells in your head. How many customers? Okay, so immediately I'm thinking frequency. But then, he says, are coming into the restaurant each night. So what does each night add? What adds a time component? So now we have frequency, but we also have a time component which is going to give us a more precise look at how many customers. Because instead of just counting the customers, I can now look at each night, right? And I can say, well, on Monday nights, this many customers. On Tuesday nights, or on the first night, or on Saturday night. And I have a lot more analysis. There's a lot more analysis I can do for this type of measurement. So when we have frequency plus a time component, what measurement is that? Hey, frequency. Well, frequency would work, right? We could count how many customers, but it doesn't really give us a frame of reference. If we add rate, though, 
now we have customers per night, which gives us a lot more information and allows for a lot more analyses. If rate is, is usable, it's almost always better, right? And now that's not an 100% hard and fast rule, but it's just going to give you so much more context to what you're counting. If I'm just counting customers without context, what is that really telling me? Instead, I can look at, oh, well, on Monday nights, we get 100 customers. On Saturday night, we get 300 customers. That tells me a lot more. And that's the idea behind measurement. What measurement can we use that's going to make sense, but also give us the most data and analysis possible? And so rate is just going to be better. Duration doesn't make sense because we're not timing anything. There's no time involved. And partial interval recording also doesn't make sense because we want the full night, one, so it's continuous, and two, partial interval recording is not going to give us a how many. So what measurement is going to be best? Well, rate, because it has the frequency and the time component together. And then 16, you are observing a parent meeting conducted by your supervisor. Your supervisor is explaining to the parents that the client screaming is trending down. What does your supervisor mean by this? What does your supervisor mean by trending down? And what is trending down? The client screaming. So the client screaming is trending down. And what is a trend? A trend is simply saying, what direction is the behavior moving? Is it moving up? Is it moving down? Is it flat? And this is a term rate related to graphing. So if you looked at a graph and you saw your trend line, if it's moving up, what's happening? Well, it's increasing. If it's moving down, what's happening? It's decreasing. So when the supervisor says your client screaming is trending down, what they're saying is the screaming is decreasing. And so is that a good or bad thing? Well, that's good. If the client screaming is trending down, it's decreasing, that's likely very good. So what does your supervisor mean by this? A, the behavior is increasing. No, because it's trending down. So if you, if you visualize a graph in your head and a downward trend line, that means the behavior is going from 10 to 8 to 6 to 4. B, the behavior is increasing. Again, no. So we're looking at C or D. The behavior is decreasing and getting worse. Well, if the behavior is decreasing, it's not going to be getting worse. It's going to be getting better. So your supervisor, by saying trending down, is implying to the parent that the behavior is decreasing and it's getting better. Great. Thanks for watching. Make sure you subscribe for all of our updates. Check out btexamreview.com for all of our study materials. As always, let us know when you pass so we can include you in the Sunday shout out. Work hard, study hard. See you soon.